So I would, uh, I would hope that people who see this realize that she was a tremendously good gal. Not what some people have portrayed her. She was just a sweet person. Jim returned to Hollywood to retrace those long ago years. To get him in the proper spirit, we traded in his airport rental car for a 1940 Ford Coupe, just like the one he owned when he drove the girls crazy at Van Nuys High. Now we're approaching uh, Van Nuys High School now, and uh, this is the school that uh, I graduated from and uh, Norma Jean went to with uh, B.B. Goddard, and uh, Jane Russell went to this school also. I haven't seen Jane Russell since, I think it was around 1944. I haven't seen Robert Mitchum since 1942, 43, something like that. I have never heard one woman who ever worked with Marilyn ever say one cross or derogatory word about her. And that in itself is monumental. Have you? Never. She had um, just a tremendous amount of sympathy and empathy and feeling for uh, people, situations, and uh, she was always a little unhappy and mad at the big, <laughs> the big boys, you know. Never a hairdresser, never a wardrobe woman, or never. You never heard, or a woman with whom she was working, you have never heard one woman say a cross word about her. She was certainly not your dumb blonde at all. She's a very bright, sensitive girl. The crew? The crew loved her, honest to God. She was a darling to the crew. She would, had very, a lot of empathy and understanding, and she had a fey sense of humor, which was really very cute. And uh, they all adored her. For her loyalty, she was immensely loyal to a fault, really, to her friends, to anyone she knew. She, she had a great sympathies for people. She was... Uh, really as straight and decent as you could want. You know, she was a very humorous girl. Actually, one of the funniest girls on The Natural that I've ever met, really. Funny girl she was, really. And, uh, but she tried very hard, and she felt uh, inadequate, truly, you know. She had physical problems, and, uh, which certainly didn't uh, encourage her, her uh, confidence, you know, did not build her confidence. But uh, she was one of, the, really, one of the most uh, honest, loyal, earnest people that I've ever met, and generous to a fault. You know. She did have a chip on her shoulder about it. And it's too bad if she could have dropped that, it, she might not have had to fight so hard. Well, I was her friend, and Jane was her friend. Very, very good friends. You know, she became like a family friend, really. Yeah, that's, that's old Curly. That's the girl I married. Hollywood is really a, a town of magic where people can be made kings and queens overnight, so to speak. I recall when uh, Norma Jean first, to get her first contract, she had to be single. They didn't want a married person in there. They didn't want her to get pregnant. Today, they don't care whether they get pregnant or not, I guess. They don't even care if they're married. I could have taken care of her. She wouldn't have had this problem. I could have been her friend. I would never let her get this way. I would have taken care of her. Grauman Chinese. Boy, if these walls could talk. I've been uh, gone for about a year, and I came back from uh, overseas, and Norma Jean and I came to a movie here. And we're sitting down there near the front end of the thing, and we're kind of cuddling and kissing. And this old gal behind us keeps batting the back of our chair. And finally, Norma Jean turned around and said to her, look, my husband's been gone for a year. And if I want to kiss him and cuddle him, 
I'm going to. And then about that time, the movie started, and there was Robert Mitchum up there. He's a commander of an aircraft carrier. He went from Lockheed assembly line to a commander of an aircraft carrier in one year. And I told Norma Jean, I said, I know that guy. I worked with him at Lockheed, for God's sake. And she just kind of giggled. Can you imagine that? And later they made a movie together, for God's sake. hard. Uh, I would go home after a day's work and I was exhausted and I wanted to go home and spend it with my family and eat dinner and, and relax for a few hours. She'd go and work with her coach until, you know, midnight sometimes and then turn around and come back in the next morning. I don't know how she did it. All, everybody wanted to help her because she was so, she was a very sweet, um, sensitive, super sensitive girl. In fact, she got her feelings hurt a lot of times when she really didn't have to because she was so sensitive. Um, to me, it was just a, it was a wonderful combination. Here was a little helpless blonde who was doing all the, you know, collecting diamonds and, uh, the dame that didn't care about diamonds at all, but would rather have a real love life. <laughs> you know, it was a good combination, and I knew that. We're just two little girls from Little Rock. We lived on the wrong side of the track. But Little Rock, or Square Rock, these gals must have their a great book. Greater is a Broadway stage hit, and even more gorgeous, glittering, and hilarious on the screen. With Marilyn Monroe as Lorelei Lee, the world's most fabulous gold-digging blonde. I just love finding new places to wear diamonds. And Jane Russell as Dorothy Shaw, the world's most talked-about brunette. Mr. Edmund and I are going to be married. To each other? Of course to each other. Who else to? Well, I don't know about you guys. I always sort of figured Lorelei would end up with the Secretary of the Treasury. Grow cold as girls grow old And we all lose our charm in the end But square cut or pear shape These rocks don't lose their shape Diamonds are a girl's best friend I recall when I was a young officer on the LAPD, I was sent here at the premiere of the asphalt jungle, and I was down here to direct traffic. And I kept thinking maybe Norma Jean would drive by, but she was sick. She never showed up, never saw her. Marilyn Monroe is Angela, the easy living green eyed blonde. Haven't you bothered me enough, you big banana head? Just try breaking my door, and Mr. Emmick will throw you out of the house. James Whitmore has got the strong arm boy, a right guy in a wrong world. I haven't seen Bob since we worked at Lockheed, and that that was, must have been 43? 42. And 42, and I think uh, it was about... 42 or 43. 
Yeah, well, it was right in there. And I think uh, I saw you at the uh, that nightclub in the 40, 44, 43, 44? Yeah. You, you, didn't you have that boxer? Was he boxing? Weren't you his manager, owner, or something? Oh, he would beat no, up pretty bad. No. No? I, you were just nursing him. <laughs> you and Bob were taking care of him. He looked like he'd lost that night. <laughs> that boxer did, poor guy. It wasn't Art Aragon, was it? Oh, Golden Boy? Yeah. Jeez. Oh, we got some That's good boxers out there. That's 50 years. Huh? That's 50 years. Think yeah. about it. Think about that. How about yeah. them apples? Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a while. I know it isn't that long because I'm not that old. <laughs> Small world apartment. Yeah, it sure is. really. It sure really. is. Well, I've, I've thought about this so many times, you know, and I've always wanted to get to see. I wrote you a letter one time, yeah. but I never got it. Did you get it? Yep. Why the hell didn't you answer it? <laughs> he never answers letters. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But if you cross Jay, you'd be in trouble. Where if you cross Norma Jean, she just feels sad. Yeah, she cries. Yeah. And I, that, that was the difference between the two. She did not understand how to come back. That's right. She <laughs> not. I had four brothers. That's so. what I know. I've got to say that you, you four brothers raised you properly. Norma Jean, you know, suffered a lot of wounds that she forgave because she never really realized that she had been wounded. You know, she was she was betrayed, if you will, by people whom she trusted. Right. You know. And she still continued to trust them and, and to uh, to support them, and and that was it. You know, she, people took enormous ad advantage of of her innate generosity yeah. and uh, used her up. You know, honestly, you know that. Yep. Yeah. I remember when I when you were working together. What was it? A fox, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. And uh, I had dressing room around the corner. There had been Greg, Greg Peck's dressing room. And it was all done in sort of early American furniture and stuff like that. My secretary came in, she said, you better get rid of that stuff because there's not going to be in here, anybody in here but grips and juicers, you know. And they'll sit on that stuff and break it. You know, just get Ruin a, it. Yeah, get a big plank table here and a, a usable bar and, and, and not non-fragile glasses. You know. So anyway, I come off the set, and uh, she's in the dressing room, and through the louvers, you know, she's whispering, you know, uh, Bob, you know, uh, can I talk to you, Gwen? And uh, they had, they didn't, they didn't want to use her voice, on the, whatever it was, on the, some song. Anyway, so she played me this acetate, the test record. And I said, that's a so-and-so uh, arrangement, isn't it? And she said, yes. And I said, well, it's got too much brass in it. And uh, what you need is uh, an instrument which gives you confidence, which carries the tonic melody, you know, so that you can follow it, so that you're always reassured because she was not too sure of herself. She had a very sweet voice, you yeah. know, very sm small, but very sweet and absolutely true voice. So I said, I think the wood clarinet probably, you know, will carry you through. So have them rearrange it, you know, so that you have a tonic uh, reference all the way through the number. And uh, so she's writing all this down. And she did it, as a matter of fact, and they, you know, did it. So she said, would you like a drink? And I said, yeah. I said, as a matter of fact, I was just on my way around. So she brings out a glass, and she puts some gin in it, and she puts some scotch in it. She put some vodka in it. She I said, what the I hell are you know. doing? She said, well, this is a cocktail, isn't it? Isn't that how you make a cocktail? I said, forget it, honey. I, you know, I'll check you later. Oh, so a couple of times later, this is when she was on, lived on the Eni, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, so she invite, invite me and my stand-in, Tim Wallace, over for dinner. And I said, honey, if you cook like you at that bar, I said, I, I got a pass. <laughs> But she was totally, you know, innocent. sincere and innocent about it. She said, isn't that how you make a cocktail? She's putting all this booze and mixed up in a... I said, i got to pass this. Did you teach her that? <laughs> she mixed my brother and I and my brother's girlfriend three drinks with one fifth. And she thought that's the way you did it. Yeah? 
And I said, it's nice of you to be even, you know. Everybody got an equal amount, but that's too much. <laughs> Boy. She, she was going to cook. Oh, no, I... She was a good cook. I'm sure. She was a good cook. She, uh, her favorite dish, not because she liked to eat it, was to put a steak, peas, and carrots, because she liked the color. Yeah. Oh, yes. I remember. Yeah, she liked the I color. Mean, yeah. She could make a lemon pie, but she had the cookbook out. She followed it right down like she was making a blueprint. And she but she got, good. you know, well, she... I'm glad that was that happened for her. The, you know, the, I made a lemon pie and put the knife in it, and it all ran right back together. <laughs> I've never cooked since. <laughs> You didn't use the same book, that's all. No. But they used to. They have a word now for this condition, you know. She used to get up in the morning, and she had a hairdresser up in Sunset Boulevard. An early appointment with a hairdresser, like 7 o'clock or something like that. So she'd go up there, and then she'd come back, and stop in her apartment, and then she'd start to panic. You know, and then she'd start to panic, and she, was, she couldn't go out. You know. and there's a name for this now, you know, but she was... Just uh, terrified of uh, meeting people and being judged. I mean, you know. yeah. She just was in the wrong business. She was very shy. You know. yes, she yes. was enormously yes, shy. Hard working. <laughs> One final question remains unanswered: Who was Marilyn Monroe's real father? Was she Norma Jean Mortensen? or Norma Jean Baker? Neither Mortensen or Baker was the father. Uh, I think Baker was the, was one of the husbands that Gladys was married to, and I think Mortensen was another that she was married to. And Baker was the one that was, most possibly could have been her father, but he wasn't. And uh, so she used Baker most of the time. She asked Ethel Jordy, Jimmy's mother, to tell her about her father, uh, sent the picture she had of him, which she had shown me so long before. And I did keep it a total secret. I didn't, I never mentioned it to her. She wrote Grace a letter thanking her for telling mom, Mrs. Doherty, and having her tell her. And uh, she hoped that she would be able to See your father, she loved the picture. So. She called him. We were over there at that little house on Hermitage when she made the phone call one night. And she got him on the phone, and uh, he wouldn't recognize her. She was very, very hurt, hurt very bad. So she took a lot of TLC that night, just, you know, comforting, holding, cuddling, and uh, she'd come out all right. She, she's a good girl, real good girl. 